Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host. Thank you for joining in today. I hope you guys are doing okay. There's a lot going on in the world between the pandemic and now the war in Ukraine. Um, it's a lot. It's scary. I have to say, sometimes I look at my podcast episodes and I see which ones are trending or being shared, and a podcast I recorded two years ago with my friend and nuclear radiation guru, Dr. Andrew Karam, was trending. That episode was titled, How Can You Survive a Nuclear Bomb? So I guess people are nervous, but also hopeful and want to prepare. Um, It's an interesting podcast. Maybe check it out. Yeah, everyone thinks you're doomed. There's a high chance you're doomed if they drop a nuke, but there's a slim chance you might survive if you follow Dr. Karam's plan. But on today's Causes or Cures episode, we are going to talk about animal research. How valuable is animal research? How applicable are the results from animal trials to human trials? How often do positive results in animal trials translate to positive results in human trials? Is anybody monitoring this? Are there any alternatives to animals? And you know, how are the animals treated? Is it completely ethical? Can we do better? Do the animals suffer at all? I think these are questions that a lot of people have. And just to be clear, it's pretty widely accepted by the scientific community that you must do animal trials before you do human trials. Um, You know, the idea is if something's very dangerous that shows up in animals, you don't then use it in, then you won't use it in humans. Um, But there are also a lot of people out there who may wonder about the well-being of the animals and there, you know, there are also a lot of researchers who may not want to perform research on animals um, if, you're, if you're sensitive or you just don't want to do that. So here to talk about this topic with us and answer some of these questions is Dr. Catherine Rowe. Dr. Rowe is a neuroscientist. She is the chief of the Scientific Advancement Outreach Division at PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And what this podcast will focus on is her work on developing evidence-based strategies to replace animals in scientific research, the alternatives. She'll also talk about how useful animal models have been. Is anyone monitoring this, as I said before? And better ways we could maybe spend our funding to better humans. And she's also going to talk about what young scientists can do if they do not want to perform research on animals. What kinds of animals are used in research? Well, it's mostly mice and rats um, that are genetically similar, but there's also dogs, monkeys, birds, um, and other animals used in research. Now, you know, I want to be completely honest with you guys. I want to be honest about my biases here. We all have biases, every single one of us, and no matter how good we think we are, it's really hard to sever those biases. So I think it's just good to be aware of them and make other people aware of them. I am the type of person who could never do research on animals. I would be the one freeing the mice in the lab, freeing the beagles, whatever. I That is me. That is how I am wired. You might call me a radical, but okay. I'm just telling you that's who I am. Um, you know, I am the daughter of a veterinarian, veterinarian who was just voted the best veterinarian in the area, by the way. Congratulations, Dad. You really are. Heart of gold. Um, but my whole life as a kid was a series of animal rescue missions and no life was too small. You know, for example, I grew up in an old farmhouse and of course it had mice and we always had those have a heart traps where we'd put peanut butter in, the mouse would crawl in, and before we carried the mouse outside to the adjacent cow field or graveyard, my mom would always yell, let him finish his peanut butter first. And we did, we always made sure he ate his peanut butter first. And then when we took him outside, we sent him off with a survival pack of cheese bites. I also had a raven growing up, not on purpose. He was shot by a hunter and um, my dad found him. He tried to perform surgery on his wing at the animal hospital, but it didn't work. The raven was never going to fly again. So so he had this huge pen in our backyard. We named him Nevermore and Nevermore liked roadkill. So nightly joy rides were driving around the neighborhood looking for roadkill and I'd hop out of the car if my parents spotted one and I'd pick up, you know, whether it was a dead groundhog, dead squirrel, to take home to Nevermore. It was it was funny too. Um, everybody knew. You can imagine the rumors that would arise when you saw something like this, right? I was on a really good soccer team 
that traveled all over the state and we would get to the games in carpools and you know if you saw my family's car go off the road or make a turn your normal response might be like oh the stairs had to use the bathroom but no my team was like oh the stairs must have spotted a dead groundhog on the side of the road true story and you know what i bet you that experience benefited my immune system I grew up with a hemophiliac dog who would often get bleeds and we'd transfuse him. My dad would transfuse him right on the dining room table. And then we'd serve dinner later that night on the dining room table. Um, If there was ever a skunk trapped, whether the skunk was trapped in a particular location or if the skunk had something stuck on its head, everybody always called my family. We were like the ghostbusters for trapped skunks. Who are you going to call? The stairs. And we would. We would go out there in our van. My dad would jump out of the car, try to get the thing off the skunk's head. Sometimes we'd transport the skunk. One time I left my book bag. I remember this very well. I remember I left my book bag in the car, and we had the skunk in there. Of course, the skunk sprayed because that's what skunks do. And I, you know, my book bag smelled, and I went to school with that book bag <laughs> for a while. I don't even know why I didn't get a new book bag. I guess I... I did not care. Um, I'm sure kids talked about me. She smells like a skunk. I don't know. I mean, I was still pretty popular. Um, Family hiking trips. We would always dig up coyote traps. Those coyote traps, oh, they're evil. So we would. We would just dig them up. This one, this is my last one before I connect with Dr. Rowe. This is the best one. So there was this huge hornet's nest in my grandmother's basement. And we didn't want to kill the hornets. Uh, They were just trying to live their life, and, um, you know, they had this beautiful nest. So we didn't know what to do, but my dad had this client who said he could hypnotize bees. He also said he could hypnotize other things and remove them, get them to to leave or go someplace else. I was like, okay, this is going to be a disaster, but I had to see this. So they called him up. He came to my grandmother's house. I went because I had to see this. Uh, Of course, I had an EpiPen in my back pocket because I'm not a moron. But I watched this guy stare at this hornet's nest for a while. I have no idea if this is where he was doing the hypnosis. But I swear to you, I watched him pick up the entire nest with hornets flying in and out of it, carry it to his car, and drive away. And he removed it just like that. Nothing died. Everything was fine. I, I have a picture Um, I could share with you guys. It was incredible. I think we're friends on Facebook, so if you ever want him to remove something from your house, um, (laughs) give me a call. I'll hook you up. Anyways, I'm sharing this with you because I want to be honest about my biases, and I am no way, shape, or form judging anyone who does research on animals, but I just think it's important that you know where I'm coming from. I could go on and on, but Let's connect to Dr. Rowe and get her expert opinion on this issue and maybe get some answers to some of our questions or at least ideas that we can explore. All right, one second while we connect. You look ready. (laughs) I'm ready, but I've been listening to your podcast and, and I'm really enjoying just hearing you and your other guests discuss what are always oh, very thanks. timely topics. Like I, I'm a, I'm a fan now. Oh, you, well, thank <laughs> you. I try to bring it down to earth and make it kind of approachable. And, um, so it's been great though. It's been, it, the podcast is growing, so it's, it's exciting, but, um, all right. You are a neuroscientist, right? And you work for PETA now, uh, on developing evidence-based strategies to replace animal animals in scientific research, which I find fascinating. It's, um, and it's a hot topic for sure, based on a lot of the, the news that recently came out. But can you start off by telling us a little bit more about you? How did you get involved in this? How did an, you as a neuroscientist uh, end up working for PETA? Absolutely, yeah. So um, I am a neuroscientist, as you said, prior to working with PETA, I did clinical research at the National Institutes of Health, Johns Hopkins University, and the University of California, San Diego, which is where I got my doctoral degree. And during that time, because I was predominantly working with humans, um, I knew that there were animal experiments being conducted, but I didn't really think very much about it, to be honest. I didn't think about it 
from an ethical point of view. And I didn't think about it from a scientific point of view because I was fully embedded in human-based research. But what I came to learn was that there are um, literally hundreds of thousands of animal experiments being conducted each year that aren't relevant to humans. And I also came to learn that the animals themselves were suffering considerably. I always assumed that because we have the Animal Welfare Act, that meant that animals were well cared for and that harms were minimized. But the reality is that animals are harmed considerably in laboratories. And worse, we're not getting the scientific advancements we need from animal experiments because we're not monkeys, we're not dogs, we're not cats, we're not rats. And the data is often inapplicable to humans. And so I became motivated for both scientific and ethical reasons to do my best to end ineffective animal experiments and get funding agencies, specifically the NIH, to mm -hmm. invest a lot of the money that they're quite frankly wasting on animal experiments into research that can help people. And I, I'm not the only scientist at PETA. I think a lot of people are surprised to learn PETA actually has the most scientists of any animal organization in, wor in the world. And it's basically all of our motivations to improve science, to improve health, and to improve the lives of animals in laboratories by getting them out of laboratories. So that's, a, I didn't know that actually about PETA. So thanks for making that point. I, I wanted to, so you'll hear a lot, and obviously you've worked research NIH, you'll hear this phrase, well, the animals are necessary for that preclinical step because we have to start there. And then if everything looks okay in the animals, we move to humans. So can you dive a little more into that and get into maybe some of the data? How successful are these trials in animals? And specifically, for example, coming up with saying, oh, well, this drug isn't safe it showed this in this an in this animal so therefore we can't move on with human trials um what what do you say to people who say it's a necessary step for those reasons well right now the fda legally requires any trials that go with humans to first be tested in animals but what we know from nih's own data is that 95 percent of new drugs that test safe and effective in animals go on to fail in human clinical trials. Um, we also know that when you look at disease specific areas, so say new cures for Alzheimer's disease or sepsis or cancer, our attempts to develop an HIV vaccine, those failure rates go up to nearly 100% or all the way up to 100%. So what we know from decades of data following this paradigm where we first tested animals and then move on to humans is that it's not getting us the safe and effective treatments we need. And to your point, it also may be preventing a new drug or treatment that didn't work in animals, but might very well work in humans. So it's sort of a two-pronged problem. That's interesting. On, yeah. On one hand, there are drugs that are making it to human clinical trials, and then they're either ineffective or worse, they're harmful. Or there are things being shelved, things, well, it didn't work in a rabbit, it didn't work in a dog, so we, we can't try it in humans, and it might very well be a life-saving treatment that has been put on a shelf. So the paradigm as it stands now, which is testing non-human animals, isn't working, and we really need to make some changes to make drug development more cost-efficient and more safe for humans, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to do here at PETA. I wanted to ask you, and one of the things I read that you wrote online, um, you talk about the pressure for research, researchers to publish and do research, do research. Do, and you know, we always hear publish or perish. Um, and I, I work in public health more on kind of like the policy side and, and um, you know, coming up with programs. So I'm not really into that, you know, research, but I hear it a lot. And it's just, you know, do or die kind of mentality. How does that, in your opinion, that pressure, that mentality play into animals being used in research? I think it plays a huge part because um, if you're in the academic world, as you said, the, the basic motto is publish or perish. You need to constantly be getting your research published in scientific journals. You need to constantly be getting grant fund funding from NIH. So if let's say you're working with mice or you're working with rats, when you started out in science, presumably your goal was, I really want to find 
a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease, or I really want to forward cancer research, and you start working with mice and rats, and that data isn't getting you anywhere. You may want to change. You may want to say, you know, look, I want to start working with humans, or I start, I want to start working with some of the new methodologies using stem cells. But if I do that, it's going to take a year or two years for me to transition my lab and I will lose my faculty position. So I think even in the scientific world, people are inclined to do what's comfortable because what's comfortable is safe and safe is keeping that job. And so what we need to do really is change that culture because I think everybody can agree that we want to do the best science. You know, whether you're interested in animal welfare or not, you certainly want your research dollars to be going to the best research possible. Right. And unfortunately, if an individual researcher is stuck in the mud doing, you know, forced swim tests, which is an experiment where people drop mice and rats into a beaker to study depression, they know it doesn't work, but this is what their lab is set up to do. This is what they've been doing for 10 or more years. And because they're afraid if they take the time to transition their lab to more effective research, they could lose their job. So we need that not to be the case. We need the academic institutions to be flexible, to say, listen, we want you to do the best research possible. And if you need six months to you know, tweak your lab, tweak your procedures in order to do that, feel free. That's what it should be, but that's not what it is right now. That's not what it is right now. So I recently, you know, you've heard all these things about the white coat, the white coat waste project, and there, you know, the accusations. And I went on uh, factcheck.org to to read about, to try to see what is true, what isn't. Obviously, there's a lot of information out there, and I don't know. And some of it, they said, "Oh, this isn't true." But the one study that I read about was, um, you know, an HIV drugs tested on 44 beagle pu beagle puppies, and. Uh, I wanted to ask you why they use beagles all the time, but first I wanted to to say um, what really disturbed me was when I read about the the cordectomy, which and that was funded by um, Naya and mm -hmm. how they cut the the vocal cords out. And I said to myself as I read that I winced. I'm, I mean I'm a huge dog lover. My dad's a veterinarian. We are like animal people. And I said, you know, I could never do that. I'd, I'd have to free the dogs. I'd have to get out of the lab. And I'm not, I'm not judging anybody who does do that, but I couldn't do it. I just would, I would have nightmares. I, I'd hate myself, me, just as me. So how do, and, but I, but people are, you know, they have empathy, that kind of thing. How do people justify that? Or how do they get themselves able to do it? And I'm, and I'm trying to ask that question without making people, you know, like they're not psychopaths. I get that. Right. No, but. I think, I think you're, you're asking what is a, a, a crucial question. So to the first part, um, the reason beagles are commonly used is because their temperament, um, they are very docile dogs. They're very friendly dogs. So they're less inclined to say bite people who are trying to pull them out of the cage to do a particular procedure. And the vocal cord dissection is because you know, beagles are, are chatty, you know, by nature, they're very talkative dogs. And I guess uh, experimenters don't want to hear the dogs barking and howling. Um, but to your second question, I think it's really critical for people to think about this. Um, I have spoken with uh, numerous people who worked in a laboratory setting that used animals. And what they've explained to me is that yes, they feel their initial response is one of horror, just like you said, you know, the idea that you would hurt a dog or a mouse or a monkey is horrifying. But what happens is when they're told this is really, really important, like you could save somebody's life um, Two, they're told, you know, you're doing the hardest work possible because some people don't have the stomach for this. And so if you can do this, you're doing the toughest job in science and they're reinforced for it. So if they're willing to go in and decapitate a hundred mice every day, they're rewarded. They're told you're amazing, you're great. And, and you know, within the scientific community, especially for younger people, people who are in their undergraduate years or even their graduate years, that reinforcement is key. So if you're being told you're doing something great, you're doing something wonderful, this is amazing, you're going to start to desensitize yourself. Um, but there are absolutely people who can't. And a lot of those people come to work for PETA. We have several former 
uh, animal experimenters who did their graduate work. They got all the way through their doctoral level research and said, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. And we know that people who work in labs and have to do these sort of procedures day in and day out, some of them have a form of PTSD because of the work they're doing. And nobody yeah. wants to talk about it, but it's the truth. I mean, we know, for example, you said that your dad is a veterinarian. We know that for veterinarians, um, the mental health issues associated mm -hmm. with veterinary medicine are really concerning. And the same is true for the people working in laboratories who have to do these day-to-day -day harmful procedures. And so it's another reason why we need to minimize the amount of animal experiments that are going on, especially if they're ineffective, because you know, those people need to be considered. And you're right, we shouldn't call them psychopaths because they're just doing what they're told. Right, right. Following orders, this is how it, how it is. But I, as I was thinking about that, I was like, there's no way I could do that. Or I would, like you said, and I think it's very interesting, the PTSD, like what, what is that like? Um, I remember when the super came in my building and he said, oh, there's a mouse in my bathroom. And then he stuck down a glue pad. And then I just heard the mouse and I was like, oh my God. And I'm still haunted by that. That's just mm -hmm. my level of sensitivity. And I feel really like guilty about that. And I'm just, uh, so like the idea to like, cut out vocal cords, I just couldn't, um, couldn't do it. Um, yeah. But, and a lot of people I've talked to, the one thing they tell me always is because they're in there every day, feeding the animals, watering the animals, checking oh. on them because they've, they all have so many surgical procedures. I mean, so many surgical procedures oh. go on in labs and and the pain relief they're given is often only for a couple of days. So the, the workers who are in there day in and day out get to know these animals. They can, you know, they look into their eyes, they can see their fear or their pain or their stress, and they know that they have individual personalities. You know, yeah. they're not just numbers to the people who are working there day in and day out. So yeah, I think for a lot of people, it's traumatizing and yeah. some people can get through it and some people can't. But the question becomes, why are we doing this? If we can get the answers we need about human health in any other way, we yeah. should be. Which is a great segue to my next question. Um, you have been doing research on alternative models that we could use instead of animals. Can you talk a little more about that? Absolutely. So because of the failures of animal experiments to translate into human treatments and cures, a lot of people have been working very hard to develop alternatives. And this, this, uh, these fall into any number of categories. So one category, of course, are uh, tools that we can use with humans themselves. So non-invasive tools, of course, things that will not harm humans. Um, neuroimaging is an example I like to bring up simply because it was a tool that I got to see emerge over the course of my career and then use um, we can study the human brain and body using non-invasive neuroimaging techniques in a way that I couldn't have even imagined when I started in science. So I think that's one thing. But now we're doing a lot of in vitro work. So we can take cells from humans, including patients, and turn them into organs on chips or organoids. So these are little mini systems of humans, and we can use those to study, let's say, how, how individual genes may affect brain development, how uh, a person's individual cell lines respond to a treatment. I mean, it's, it's really almost precision medicine. And these are tools that have also come a long way in the past 10 years and are turning out to be more predictive of the human response to drugs than say a mouse, go figure. You know, it's not really surprising that uh, a mini heart or a mini brain that was developed from human cells responds more similarly to humans than say the system of a mouse. Mm, yeah. And so the, these are tools that I think could really revolutionize drug development, but also disease uh, mechanism understanding. And what we need to do is make sure that we're investing an appropriate amount of our research dollars into those, but making sure that people, let's say who are working in a lab with mice have the accessibility. So if they say, you know what, I would much rather be doing this with human cell derived tissue. Can I do this? You know, is there a grant? Is there a training grant available? Is there a resource at my institute where I could start to transition? And so that's something we're making a big push for with NIH just to make sure that these modern tools, these more effective tools, these more cost efficient tools 
are available to anyone who wants to use them. That's a great idea. Even have like just having kind of like a centralized list of things or grants that people can can go for. Um, so the director of the NIH is stepping down. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means the president gets to appoint a new one. So what are your thoughts on that? What would be your message to the president, I guess, if you had his, his ear um, in terms of how, where do you want to see this go? Well, I think that the, the director of NIH is a huge, huge responsibility. Again, the, the NIH, for people listening who don't know, gets approximately 40 billion, and I just want to make sure it's billion with a B, um, <laughs> do, billion with a B, tax dollars each year to do what presumably will be health-directed research, which is great. You know, we want, to, we want to find these new treatments and cures. About half of that currently is spent on animal experiments, research using animal models that we know don't work. Um, what we need is a new director who's willing to take stock and say, listen, what we've been doing for the past several decades isn't working. You know, the NIH's mission is to advance human health, not just conduct basic science research. Of course, basic science research is important, but if that basic science research isn't ultimately le leading to human health advancements, then the NIH is failing. I hate to say it because I used to work there and I loved working there, but they're failing in their mission to Im improve human health. And if what they're doing, which is spending half of their budget on animal experiments that aren't translating to new treatments and cures for humans, they need to take stock and say, listen, we need to change some things up here. And so what we need in that position is someone who's willing to be innovative, to be daring, to be bold and say, listen, we need to, we need to make some significant changes it's going to, you know, shake some things up here. You know, again, if half the people getting NIH funding are doing animal experiments, they're going to be reluctant to make those changes because of the pressure to get tenure. You know, it's this, it's almost a cycle, right? Where people continue doing animal experiments so they can continue getting publications so they can continue getting grants. But if that cycle never involves continue advancing human health, then the cycle isn't working. And so, yeah, we need somebody in that position who is innovative and bold and, and willing to really be a leader and lead the NIH to a place where we can keep the US you know, on the top for biomedical research. Right now we're falling behind. Yeah, that's true. And is there a centralized place for, you know, for where this information would be if someone is considering, well, okay, I understand the importance of preclinical work or work, you know, before we, you know, approve it for humans, but I need more information on this before I make some of these big decisions. Oh, of course. Yeah. Well, people can go to PETA.org slash RMD. Um, what RMD stands for is the research modernization deal. And the research modernization deal is a a, a plan, a strategy, a common sense plan and strategy developed by PETA scientists, supported by the National Hispanic Medical Association, the National Medical Association, numerous other physicians and scientists. And the plan is to help the NIH phase out ineffective animal experiments and start redirecting research dollars into methodology that has a much higher chance of helping humans. And in that, people can read all of the data. Um, it very well summarizes all of the background data, all of the disease areas where animal models continue to fail. And these are things like Alzheimer's disease, cancer research, sepsis research, stroke research, um, uh, from systematic reviews conducted by outside scientists looking at the failures of animal models to produce new treatments and cures. Um, and also the plan that we're proposing, which is, is, again, it's a very common sense plan. The first step is stop spending money on animal experiments that don't work. I mean, I think that that's pretty straightforward. If we know that these animal experiments are failing 100% of the time, we should probably stop throwing taxpayer dollars at it. But one of the other steps is to have NIH review the efficacy of animal experiments. So one thing that I think a lot of people might be surprised about is that the NIH doesn't do this already. So 
even though they're given billions of dollars each year to spend on health research, whether or not the research is, you know, yielding a, a significant return on investment isn't calculated. So mm -hmm. there are disease areas where we don't actually know whether all of the money we're funneling into animal experiments is getting us where we need to go. So that's another step. And of course, um, reinvesting a lot of that money into more modern, more human-based research, I think. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it's pretty common sense. I think it's, it's something that you would assume was already happening yeah. Um, but it's not. And so we need to, quite frankly, hold NIH accountable to how they're spending our money. You know, you're spending our tax dollars in the name of our health, right? That's the justification. But if we're going to spend that much money each year, let's make sure that we're spending it on the best research possible. And so that's really what we're pushing for with NIH right now. I mean, yeah, to me, it sounds, I mean, I'm an animal person, but it sounds like a common sense and good research questions in there. Um, just taking stock, you know, reevaluating. Um, and yeah, this, taxpayers definitely don't want their money getting thrown away, although it, oftentimes it does get thrown away. But yeah, that would be very interesting. Um, I plan on checking out that website too. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowe, for your time. It was very interesting. No, oh, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you for, for pushing prevention. Um, we didn't talk about it here, but you know as well as I do that the, the, the best way to not die from a disease is not to get it in the first place. And that's of course something else we're pushing for is for NIH to redirect some of the money that it spends on failing animal experiments to prevention-based research because- Oh, amen. I'd prefer not to get cancer or Alzheimer's to start with. I would love for there to be a cure, but I'd like to skip the whole part. I'd like to skip having it. So yeah, prevention research is another thing that we're pushing. And I appreciate oh, your, yeah. your energy in that effort because I think it's really important for people to be aware of all the things that they can do that we already know to help keep themselves healthy. 100%. I'm totally on board with that. And I actually talked to doctors recently. I did a podcast with them on who dominates the biomedical research agenda. And so little funding goes to preventive strategies. And it's just alarming. And yet you see it, like we have all these chronic conditions that continue to increase obesity mm -hmm. and obes with obesity comes higher chance of cancers and all sorts of things. So um, I'm on board with that. Let's, let's see what the future holds. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We, we can get there. I honestly, I think we can make such huge strides in improving human health but we need to invest in the right things. And so, and because animals are suffering, I feel like it's a win, 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 right? Yeah. We can get animals out of laboratories. If we can stop asking young scientists to harm animals and traumatizing those young scientists. And if we yeah. can put our money into the best research possible, everybody wins. I'm game. I'm on board with that. So <laughs> happy to get your message out there and, uh, yeah, definitely come back on Causes or Cures. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and good luck with your work here. Thank you and, and same to you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining in to this episode of Causes or Cures. I hope you stick around, subscribe, share the episode. Sharing is caring. Um, and uh, if you'd like to read my blog or say hi, visit bloomingwellness.com. That's my website. Until then, I hope this episode gave you something to consider and think about and have future discussions. All right, guys, take care, and I'll see you here next time. Bye-bye.